I feel like it's been a minute since I spoke to you last, but I have just been spending time with friends and family in New York, having tons of intimate moments off camera, as well as moving into my partner's studio apartment where I'll be for the next six months or so. Hello, my fellow Earth Angels. Thank you so much for being here and joining me today. I wanted to invoke a little safe space, a digital resting place for your mind and your heart today, and just read you some poetry. Now, this is immensely relaxing to me. I thought maybe you could drink a mason jar full of water or grab a snack. I'm going to be drinking some tea. I just got out of the shower and it's about 8 a.m. I used to film videos like this all the time. I will link any previous poetry videos down below. I would read my own shitty poetry and I have loved poetry since I was in high school, since I was a freshman. I would go to poetry slams in DC and just be so immensely inspired. For me, this is relaxing, but I also just want to put a trigger warning because some of these poems may be heavy, talking about life-ending thoughts or sadness climate change. I know a lot of us have climate anxiety. I wanted to start off by reading from this new poetry book I got while I was in New York City. It's called You Better Be Lightning by Andrea Gibson. This first poem is called Every Time I Ever Said I Want to Die. Every time I ever said I want to die, I meant I am willing to do anything to live, even leave this world forever, even build a new home atop a nebula, stick a straw into a buried lake on Mars, get tipsy on anti-gravity and invent new constellations, walking the lines between undiscovered stars. When God pulls me over and asks, can you touch your nose, I could say, what knows? I'd be bodiless, a shadow in reverse, a patch of light made by the darkness I escaped. The psychology manuals say no one really wants to die. They want relief. They believe they will never find it in this world. That belief could be right or wrong. One would have to stay to find out. Friend, if you stay, at least we will be together and I have an extra straw. I could show you where the lakes on this planet are buried how you do not need light years to reach them. The dark years work too, sometimes better. Sometimes grief is the fastest route to truth. In addition to the straw, I also have a slingshot that fires rock bottoms directly at the sun until change spills from its golden pockets. That's how I got my hands on this summer afternoon. We can do anything with it, sunbathe or scream or forgive ourselves everything, most especially the thread we could not convince to close our wounds. If your wounds are still open, trust they are doors to an answer and walk through. What if we don't have to be healed to be whole? There are holes in every inch of the fabric that makes me who I am, but pull the string on my back and I'll still say, I love you and mean it whenever you want. Come flood my home with your eyes. I read that people scream when they are in pain because screaming actually lessens the pain. Anyone who asks you to hold your tongue is asking you to hold the heaviest thing in the galaxy. Forget them and remember you can tell me anything about how hard it is to stop flirting with your own expiration date. I understand being wooed by the finish line of sadness. Infinity still sends me nudes every day. I won't deny she looks amazing, but I'm taken. My hand now promised to writing every page of my story except its end. Friend, you are who taught me that a difficult life is not less worth living than a gentle one. Joy is just easier to carry than sorrow. And you could lift a city from how long you spent holding what's nearly impossible to hold. This world needs those who know how to do that. Those who can find a tunnel with no light at the end of it and hold it up like a telescope to show that the darkness contains many truths that can bring the light to its knees. Grief astronomer, adjust the lens, look close, tell us what you see. I either tear up or get chills every time I read that poem. So if you're tearing up, you are not alone and you're not alone in any of your sadness or grief. And it's so wild to me how the most real, raw, and true vulnerable experiences in this life are often the most taboo. I just feel like they need to be talked about more in safe spaces with medical professionals as well. This next poem is called Homesick, a plea for our planet about climate change. 
In the fifth grade, I won the science fair with a project on climate change that featured a paper mache ozone layer with a giant hole through which a paper mache sun burned the skin of a Barbie in a bikini on a lawn chair. Glaciers melting like the ice cubes in her lemonade. It was 1987 in a town that could have invented red hats. But the school principal gave me a gold ribbon and not a single bit of attitude about my radical political stance because neither he nor I knew it was political. Science had not yet been fully framed as leftist propaganda. The president did not have a Twitter feed starving the world of facts. I spent that summer as I had every summer before, racing through the forest behind my house, down the path my father called the old logging road, to a meadow thick with raspberry bushes, whose thorns were my very first heroes because they did nothing with their life but protect what was sweet. Sundays I went to church but struggled to call it prayer if it didn't leave grass stains on my knees. Couldn't call it truth if it didn't come with a dare to crawl into the cave by the creek and stay there until someone counted all the way to 100. I thought 100 was the biggest number there was. My mother absolutely blew my mind the day she said 101. 100 and what? Billionaires never grow out of doing that same math with years. Can't conceive of counting past their own lifespans. Believe the world ends the day they do. Why are the keys to our future in the hands of those who have the longest commutes from their heads to their hearts? Whose greed is the smog that keeps us from seeing our own nature and the sweetness we are here to protect? Do you know sometimes when gathering nectar, bees fall asleep in flowers? Do you know fish are so sensitive, snowflakes sound like fireworks when they land on the water? Do you know sea otters hold hands when they sleep so they don't drift apart? Do you know whales will follow their injured friends to shore, often taking their own lives, so as not to let a loved one be alone when he dies? None of that is poetry. It is just the earth being who she is, in spite of us stamping barcodes on the sea, in spite of us acting like Edison invented daylight. Dawn presses her blushing face to my window, asks me if I know the records in my record collection look like the insides of trees. Yes, I say. There is nothing you have ever grown that isn't music. You are the bamboo in Coltrane's saxophone reed, the mulberries that fed the silkworms that made the slippers for the ballet, the pine that built the loom that wove the hemp for Frida Kahlo's dress, the roses that dyed her paint, hoping her brush could bleed for her body. Who more than earth has bled for us? How do we not mold our hearts after the first spruce tree who raised her hand and begged to be cut into piano keys so the elephants could keep their tusks? The earth is the right side of history. Is the canyon my friend ran to when no one else he knew would echo his chosen name back to him? Is the wind that wailed through 1956 Alabama until the poplar trees carved themselves into Dr. King's pulpit? Is the volcano that pours the mercury into the thermometers held under our tongues? The earth takes our temperature, tells us when we are too hot, even after we've spent decades denying her fever. Our hands held to her burning forehead. We insist she is fine while wildfires turn redwood to toothpicks, readying the teeth of our apocalypse. She sends smoke signals all the way from California to New York City. Ash falls from the sky. Do you know the mountains of California used to look like they'd been set on fire because they were so covered in monarch butterflies? Do you know monarch butterflies migrate 3,000 miles using only the fuel they stored as caterpillars in the cocoon? We need so much less than we take. We owe so much more than we give. Squirrels plant thousands of trees every year just from forgetting where they left their acorns. If we aim to be just as good as one of the Earth's mistakes, we could turn so much around. Our living would be seed. The future would have roots. We would cast nothing from the garden of itself, and we would make the thorns proud. <sighs> Take a deep breath if you need to. Wellness check. In any given moment, on any given day, I can measure my wellness by this question. Is my attention on loving or is my attention on who isn't loving me? So thank you for listening to these selected poems. I wanted to move on to the next book to change things up a bit. This one is called Corazón by Jessica Salgado. Jessica is a Los Angeles-based Salvadorian poet who writes about her family, her culture, her city, and her brown body. 
And I really love this book because there are different chapters where you can just kind of dabble and find what you're looking for depending on your mood. There's the hunger, the fruit, um, the bruising, the ache. Corazón heals herself. And so you loved him for a long, long time. So long you thought you couldn't stop. And he didn't love you back, didn't beg you to stay, kept on living without you. You are still alive, still laugh with your own mouth, still point at the moon with the same finger. You loved him because you're so good at loving. You're so good at asking, what can I give you? What do you need? Remember the time you thought you were dying and you asked yourself to stay? Remember when you hated your own body and asked yourself to stop? Remember when you held your dead father's hand and refused to call him gone? Remember the time a man sunk his teeth into your breast and you managed to run? Remember the times you walked away from hurt? The times you said no? Said me first? Called yourself beautiful and believed it? Called yourself home and became it? Turned yourself into a song, full volume. Your sweet face leaned into a mirror. Your full lips painted red. Your dark curls a halo. Your skin spun gold. You, your greatest love, the salve for all wounds. Yes, he didn't love you. You are still alive, still pointing at the moon with all of your fingers, extended towards your reflection. Bruja. I used to think of myself as lonely, as a hungry bruja howling at the moon for a body to hold. But ever since the last man left, the one who called himself animal and I didn't correct, I've been casting spells for new things. Poems, good hair days, a pot of coffee, a delicious book to read, something new to laugh at, a stage for my witchcraft full moons to land on my empty bed, a howl so clear that I become enough body to hold for my restless arms. Next, I'm going to read a poem from The Gift, poems by Hafiz. We have not come here to take prisoners. We have not come here to take prisoners, but to surrender ever more deeply to freedom and joy. We have not come into this exquisite world to hold ourselves hostage from love. Run, my dear, from anything that may not strengthen your precious budding wings. Run like hell, my dear, from anyone likely to put a sharp knife into the sacred, tender vision of your beautiful heart. We have a duty to befriend those aspects of obedience that stand outside of our house and shout to our reason. Oh, please, oh, please come out and play. For we have not come here to take prisoners or to confine our wondrous spirits, but to experience ever and ever more deeply our divine courage, freedom, and light. And lastly, I wanted to read some passages from Glennon Doyle's Untamed. I highly recommend this book. This book really just inspires me to embrace the fullness of who I am without apology and to actively embrace myself as a form of revolution. Let's see, I'm just gonna go through random pages that I've underlined. Self-hatred is harder to unlearn than it is to learn. It is difficult for a woman to be healthy in a culture that is still so very sick. It is the ultimate victory for a woman to find a way to love herself and other women while existing in a world insisting that she has no right to. So I'm working hard at health and wholeness every day. I'm an advocate for women's equality because at my roots, I know the truth. I know what my body is for. It's not for men's use. It's not for selling things. It's for loving and learning and resting and for fighting for justice. I know that every body on this earth has equal unsurpassable worth and yet I still have the poison in me. I still have all the biases that were instilled in me for decades. I still struggle to love my body every single day. 50% of all my daily thoughts are about my body. I still step on the scale to check my self-worth. Subconsciously, I would likely still judge a thinner, younger woman to be worth more than a heavy, older woman. I know that often my knee-jerk reaction is not my wild, it's my taming. So I can correct that misguided first judgment, but it takes me a deliberate effort. We become the air we breathe. 
And this chapter is so powerful because it really speaks to all the internalized paradigms that we carry within us. Internalized misogyny is a huge one, internalized fat phobia and diet culture, internalized homophobia, internalized gender norms. And we really do have to actively work to move through these things. Being curious and being okay with being wrong makes you a really good student and makes you very teachable in this day and age. And I think that's so important. To be humble is to be grounded in knowing who you are. It implies the responsibility to become what you were meant to become, to grow, to reach, to fully bloom as high and strong and grand as you were created to. It is not honorable for a tree to wilt and shrink and disappear. It's not honorable for a woman to either. I've never pretended to be stronger than I am, so I'm sure as hell not going to pretend I'm weaker than I am. I'm also going to quit requiring modesty from other women. I don't want to find comfort in the weakness and pain of other women. I want to find inspiration in the joy and success of other women, because that makes me happier. Because if we keep disliking and tearing down strong women instead of loving them, supporting them, and voting for them, we won't have any strong women left. When I see a joyful, confident woman moving through the world with swagger, I'm going to forgive myself for my first reaction because it's not my fault. It's just my conditioning. First reaction, who the hell does she think she is? Second reaction, she knows she's a goddamn cheetah. Halla fucking Luya. And I can truly say when I see a powerful, confident woman, it literally makes me so happy and proud and uh, just surges this light and empowerment within me that I don't know, we're all doing this together. Or even just people who know themselves in general, like all people everywhere owning who they are, using their voice or not using their voice, dressing however they want to dress, knowing themselves enough to know what they like and don't like. I remember I was at a music festival a while ago and this guy offered me some gum and I was like, oh no thank you, I'm picky. I'm okay. And then she was like, no, you're not picky. You just know what you like and you don't like that flavor and that's okay. And she just reassured me fully in that moment. And I was like, whoa, you're right. I don't have to like degrade myself in every moment for knowing what I like or for saying no to something. That moment was eye-opening for me. It touched me and just reminded me that my being is not something that I have to apologize for. And I think that that's why it's so empowering to see anybody owning who they really are because we condemn so many aspects of ourselves. I feel like it's so important to connect to that internal, omnipresent, witnessing self who can just see that beyond everything that changes, there's this beautiful witnessing light and resting our confidence and our knowing there would be really helpful. I thank you so much for being here with me today and maybe invoking a moment of peace and reflection. Hopefully this wasn't too heavy for your heart, but I honestly feel like poetry gives us permission to feel deeply and that alone is just feels so safe to me to not have to run away from any of my experiences and just to have a moment to sit with what's coming up. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for being here, for rising into the fullest, most true and beautiful version of yourself and have patience with yourself if it's something you're still struggling with or you're undoing a lot of paradigms and programs. I cherish you so deeply. Thank you so much for joining me today and I hope to see you in a video soon. Bye.